In the past 15 years, we changed a lot the way we consume a piece of information, literally transforming the way we report the news and tell the stories. The news today is more accessible to be consumed in many different ways, and we use a different approach to evaluate what we can get. Swipe up and get a point, play and get entertained, click, be informed and share, and much more. In this episode, I'm talking with Hal Luca, VP of Design at Axio, about his unexpected professional journey and what kind of role design has in the new and media industry. Okay, three, two, one, live. Welcome, Al, and thank you to join to this episode, Alias Stories. Where do you live? My pleasure. Ah, where I live? I live in upstate New York, Westchester. Okay. Always in the New York area, fantastic. How's it yeah. going with the, all this kind of problem with the coronavirus and the pandemic and the lockdown? I think it's a mixed uh, mixed feelings. Um, we struggled a lot with uh, mm. school, home homeschool. It was tough. I uh, believe it. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that you are trying to do multiple things at the same time, working. <laughs> and try to help your kids. Um, I was I was very lucky because my wife was not working during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So she basically uh, took control of the, the homeschooling thing, which was really, really helpful. Uh, and now during vacation time, um, we're missing so much summer camp because again, I mean, there is no summer camp. I believe. So the kids are around. Uh, <laughs> my wife is back to work, so now I have them uh, the entire okay. day. Okay, I go. In. But the, the good thing, here. the good thing, yeah, the good thing is that I mean, living upstate, we have more space, so they can play outside, and um, that helps. Uh, and we're, but we are surviving. I would say. I mean, I can, I can wait to to go back to normal. To be honest, go, but, working from home is good as well. It's yeah. a good thing. Uh, but I think we need to find a balance in between remote and being in person, seeing someone in front of you. I, I kind of lack that, and I think that's important. So that would be probably a middle term in between going full remote uh, and going to yeah. the office maybe twice a week or things like that. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I totally agree with you, and I think it was actually – a very interesting point about it's going to change the way we work. But let me introduce to let me introduce you to everyone before I go ahead. Uh, you okay? First, you are Brazilian, right? Yes. Born in Brazil, fantastic. Born in you Brazil. You working around the world for different international organizations such as United Nations, and but also you spend a lot of years working in the news and media industries, working for company in Europe like Sky, in the US here like Viacom. And now as VP of design in Axio, actually, I think it's some amazing, incredible company right now. Tell me more about your journey. And uh, because I'm curious about what was planned and what wasn't, because <laughs> normally people know, don't start a big career and say, oh, I want to work, uh, especially in the news and media industries. And after you finish over there, how has happened? Yeah, er everything in my career was not planned. <laughs> everything. I never planned anything in my career. Um, so the journey, trying to be brief, because otherwise this would take too long, is, um, yeah, so I was I was born in Brazil. I, I did school and I went to, to college uh, in Brazil where I, I, I major in graphic design at that time. Okay. We are talking about the 90s yet. And, uh, but I, because I come from an Italian family, uh, and I mean, you know, you are Italian, so it, we are very strong in terms of um, cultural ties. And uh, and I had this dream to go to Italy and uh, mm. and just see how things were there. So I finished college and I went to Italy, and I and I started looking for a job there. I basically brought my portfolio, and again at that time it was basically just a printed portfolio, not an online website. Yeah. I remember the time. Yeah, and I started calling companies there. And um, my Italian was really, really bad at that time. But uh, it, it is much, much easier to learn Italian than uh, to learn English. So I kind mm -hmm. of got Italian, I think, in six months. I was already uh, speaking fluently. So uh, I, I, I was there looking for a job. And, um, and I remember that I, I kept an agenda 
uh, with the companies that I was calling and the companies mm. that I, some sort of a funnel, right? So I would call, I don't know, 180 companies, I remember. Yeah. And then I got interviews, like 10, 10 interviews. And from those 10 interviews, I got one job offer. So I, uh, and, uh, and, um, and I started working in Italy and I stayed there for, for eight years, pretty much, uh, doing design work there. So, and I did a lot of different design work there. I did illustrations, I did uh, tourism guides. Um, and then versus the end, mm. I started doing um, websites. Uh, but also versus the end, uh, when I was actually working at Sky, Sky Italy, I was always doing some sort of freelance work. Mm. And there is a long story there, but basically I did a video in Flash okay, that went, the time. <laughs> yeah, went viral. Uh, and, and someone at the UN saw that video, mm. uh, the UN at the United Nations in, in, um, in Swiss, I mean, because United Nations have many different agencies around the globe, right? So many of them, sure. exactly, many of them are here in, in New York, but we have, uh, United Nations have a lot of UN agencies in Swiss, in Turin, uh, in Italy, um, in Geneva. So at that time, someone uh, in Geneva, actually, uh, ILO, International Labor Organization, mm -hmm. they saw that video because that video was basically uh, uh, turning down the population of the earth into just a hundred people. Okay. And then basically splitting that into, okay, what's your race? Uh, what, I mean, how many people have access to, uh, sanitation? Uh, how much money would that sort of small village spend on military mm. and this sort of stuff? So it would be very easy for you to take, uh, a, uh, a glance on how bad we are in terms of uh, commonwealth and distribution of, of of wealth and this sort of stuff. So someone at the UN saw that and they and they asked me to do something similar, but focused on the issue of uh, labor, uh, child labor, basically. So I did that, and then uh, other UN agencies saw that. But then at that time was an agency, the UNFPA, it's the United Nations Population Fund. Mm -hmm. And they are based here in New York. They asked me to do another one for them. And then I kind of started getting projects from mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. UN. Uh, and uh, so I decided uh, after maybe a couple of years in, I decided to open a studio and basically mm -hmm. just uh, work for myself. At that time, I went back to Brazil. So we decided to go back to Brazil. And because of uh, labor cost and everything, it kind of being cheaper down there, I decided to uh, build up a studio. So I, I actually had a studio for many years. And keep working for the UN. We had a lot of projects for the UN. We did the first video portal for the UN, uh, where uh, that was 2007, I think. We got a, a, a Webby uh, award for that. Uh, we did a bunch of very cool stuff for them. And in 2013, because at that time I was doing, uh, most of the work that I was doing for the United Nations were focused, uh, or let me rephrase that, was basically coming from United Nations here from New York. Okay. I would come to New York like twice a year, three times a year, just to pitch new projects, to deliver mm -hmm. projects and this sort of stuff. So one specific project, uh, they asked me to be here for six months. And hmm. it was exact the same time when my wife, she sold the store that she had in Brazil. So she was kind of asking, okay, what's next for me? Hmm. And then we say, okay, let's go. I mean, we stay there for six months and then exactly. we come back. That's the moment. Uh, take the exactly, yeah. But then the, <laughs> those six months turned to become nine months. And then it became 12 months. And then Viacom appeared. Uh, Viacom basically they were uh, they were introducing this sort of design centric approach to uh, to 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 their brands, hmm. uh, and it was a central team. So it's kind of confusing because before they had design teams in every brand. So okay. Nickelodeon, yeah, Nickelodeon, Paramount, they would also, they, they would always, all of them, they would have design teams. They're an independent team, okay. Exactly. 
And I was basically uh, putting up a central team. So we would, for example, give the brands uh, the video player. So the video player is something that uh, the brand doesn't need to be worried about because the central team would deliver on that. Yeah. So I joined them because, again, they would sponsor my visa, and uh, and uh, and uh, and I agree with my wife, my wife at that point. You know what? Let's just stay. And then, uh, of course, that it was a kind of tough decision because I had to basically shut down the studio. I believe uh, it. Yeah. So we, I, I had, I had to find agreement with uh, the employees and basically splitting the work that we still had to deliver. But we, uh, we did that in a. I, I would say in a proper way, and every everybody kind of uh, went into to different directions, but it was uh, it was it was okay to everybody, and we stayed. And so I stayed at I stayed at Viacom for four years, I think. Uh, and a lot of things changed, a lot of re reorgs. So basically, what I told you before about every brand uh, having a design team. That changed a few years in, and I I inherited basically the entire design team. So I, when I left there, I had a team of pretty much I think uh, fifteen designers uh, mm. working in in uh, in this uh, wide label platform. So basically, we went away from the idea of having specific platforms for each brand, and actually building a streaming service that could uh, basically. Could be customized by every Whatever brand, but the white label is still the foundation of everything that we were doing. So we I'm, have... cu I'm curious about because you at the time was coming from the United Nations, I mean, working f for the United Nations, who I'm pretty sure is a very complex organization, but working as an external partner is a kind of completely different from being inside in a large and complex company. In Viacom, rather than you be inside the company, yeah. How was the change to working with such big uh, structure, with a lot of actually uh, unit, a lot of brands, are very always be very independent, and now figure out to work together? It was challenging? Was difficult? No, it was. Uh, it was very. How can I say? Pleasable, to be honest with you, mm. and I can tell you why. Um, when for all those years when I had my own studio and you, I don't know, I don't know, you, you probably know a lot of that already, but um, you have to take care of everything. Yeah. And when I say everything is everything, it's even buying the cookies, buying coffee, because I was not a big studio. I had a studio. I think the most, the most that I had was probably a team of 10 people. Okay. So that's, that size would change based on projects, but it would be mm -hmm. in between six and 10 people. So bad. I'm not talking about a big company where mm -hmm. I have, for example, a COO. Uh, no, it's basically me as the owner making sure that we have money to pay the bills, money to pay salaries, uh, and again, money to pay cookies and coffee, and calling the 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 lady or whatever the company to come and because we need to clean the studio, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, uh, and. And again, going to the bank and and I don't know, trying to get a loan to pay something else. So it's extremely, extremely hard. And design, which is what I love to do, mm -hmm. kind of goes, maybe I would say at the end of the line, because you need to be thinking about running the company. Yeah, make it so the condition I, to do the work. Exactly. So when I had when I had this opportunity to join a company, you're totally right. One of the, my big questions was was Wow, I mean, this would change everything because basically uh, this means that I I have to go back to design, which was something that I was kind of uh, letting go, mm -hmm. right? And and the big question was, can I do that? Will I will I be able to do that? Uh, I thought that I, understand I did you. I, I feel like I feel like often what's happened when you stop to do the things you are passionate and love for a while, you have a kind of feeling you are losing that kind of superpower. And you have a fear to don't find anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, you can, it's that it's that that thing that uh, I think Steve Jobs said one day, right? I mean, you have to you have to wake up in the morning, look at the mirror and say, okay, I'm excited about what I'm going to do today. 
and yeah. I and and running a studio, even though it was, it is pretty cool, it is nice. You have freedom, and I was doing. Uh, we were doing pretty nice projects for the UN, but still, I mean, it's very. Um, how can I say? I, I I don't want to use politics as a word, but even, but probably that's uh, that's the best the best to describe the what what happens when you design for such a big organization. Mm -hmm. There is so much that go goes into the weeds of designing uh, for uh, an organization like the United Nations. And at that time, I would say that probably eighty percent of what we were doing uh, were projects for the United Nations. So just the fact that I would see myself uh, away from that and, mm -hmm. and, the, I, and again, being focused on doing design, which, was, uh, which is what I love to do, that was uh, a no-brainer for me. And, uh, and, and I think that was the main reason that I found myself very, uh, very happy and, uh, and, and I, could, I could absorb uh, the reality, the new reality, very easily. That's actually great, Amiga. And do is kind of drastical change in the life. Uh, if you find the balance in the way what you do and the people you have around is definitely the best things to happen. And uh, just to continue, now you are not anymore in, in Viacom. Now oh, yeah. you are VP of design on Axio. Who sound to me a little bit more like a lean type of organization, yeah. probably more flexible compared to Viacom, but probably with a more challenging. <laughs> yeah, so that was, uh, that was again. So again, uh, this is all going back to nothing is planned, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is just happening. Everything is just happening. Uh, so yeah, uh, I was those like four or five years of Viacom and, um, and then uh, a person that I know, uh, my, my current manager, my boss, I, I met him at Viacom and he left mm -hmm. years before I left. But he basically was um, uh, is the CPO on Axios, and um, and I didn't know anything about Axios to be honest. But when we start talking about what would design mean for the company, I think it was extremely challenging, hmm. and and the idea of going away from this huge type of organization like Viacom was. That I mean, they have more than ten thousand people working uh, in every corner of the world. To a startup, uh, basically, right? That basically, I mean, yeah. we are now we are now two hundred people. Uh, it was again another challenge that I was kind of uh, looking for. Uh, I had experience building up my studio. I had experience working for a big organization. I had experience doing consultancy for a lot of different type of uh, companies and organizations while I had my own studio. But I really never had experience working for a startup. Hmm. So I jumped. I jumped in, and uh, and I think uh, and I think it's been quite a ride. Uh, Axios is growing a lot. We have very unique presence. I would say uh, we are trying to be smart about the way we build the brand that we have, which is another thing that I think is awesome for my career. Because when I joined Axios, I joined uh, to basically build up the product design organization. Okay. Uh, we are building. I mean, we were building. We were redesigning the website. We were building an app, which is uh, which is available already. We are building another product, which would be public uh, any um, by the end of the year. So uh, I was kind of designing and building the team. Uh, the team now is there. And then because of some reorgs that we had, I I, I absorbed brand and growth as well. So we now have okay. a team of. Designers doing brand growth and product design, uh, and I'm pretty proud of what we're building there. I mean, you can totally see that we have a different approach to the way we uh, write news. So that's uh, that's one big thing for us for us in terms of acquiring audience. People see us as as a, a quicker and smarter way to read the news. And my challenge right now is to to kind of translate that into design and make sure that we don't have that, we don't lose that identification that we currently have with our yeah. current audience. Yeah, I think it actually is great the, the fact you can in some way influence and coordinate all this kind of different area of design from the product, but also from the brand, from the growth. 
because you can really establish some this kind of common narrative vision narrative and now the way correct you know. and i'm correct. very curious because as you say i'm noticed and i'm passionate to see how axio actually shape the the information in a different way what i mean how, you have seen probably more of 10 years how how design changed for the news and media you say at a viacom you design a different way to create a, this kind of video player for all the brands how they consume our consumer can actually enjoy and consume the videos but from your point of view how much has changed the way we design around news i mean I remember many years ago it was all about you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of information, a lot of copies, few images, and stop. Now I'm looking at Axio website is more like images, very uh, short block of copies and information, but very well organized, very uh, time sensitive consumption in some way. Yep, it is. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, so we have uh, we have the concept of smart brevity. So everything that we write, that we create as content, is based on on the 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 mission to get people smarter, faster. Okay. And the only way that you can do that is to provide content that can be digestible very quickly, but still mm. with their, with the the, the systems that uh, the news require is still there. So when I heard, for example, when I heard from Mike, my 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 boss, the the why Axis is doing things differently, um, I thought, oh, probably it's just the way they write, right? I mean, instead of mm -hmm. writing, I don't know, a two thousand words article, you yeah. just write four hundred words article. But it's not like that. There is a technique uh, behind the way our newsroom writes, uh, and it's uh, actual technique. I mean, you can teach that to people. Uh, so that's why you can uh, you can read an access article and still get what what matters, what is important for you to know. So we have what we call the axiom. So it's basically what's new, what's matter, uh, the bottom line, my thought bubble. Bubble. There, there are plenty of them, and you see what is funny is that you see this now being uh, used by other companies as well. You see bullet points coming mm -hmm. from news outlets that would never use bullet points but now they're kind of using it and this is kind of at the same time it's i think it's normal because they need to adapt i mean we're yeah. talking about new new type of audiences right i mean uh people who were i don't know 10 years uh ago reading uh, a sort of uh, a sort of publication is now reading another type of publication because now they are 25 30 years old and you you want to keep pace with that audience that it's coming uh, and and reading and looking for news, but there is also the trust and there is also the the balance in between content and advertisement, for example. And I mm. think I'm I'm very proud about the the work that we do around that. Uh, I mean, if you open an article on Axios, you will see probably maybe one or two ads. Uh, and if you compare that to the major news outlets, you probably have 10 ads in the same article. So there is always uh, those type of questions in, on top of our mind when we design uh, is basically, how can we make sure that we make the most of the user's time? We don't want to hook the user and keep reading, reading, reading. We want to make sure that they know what's what matters, that hmm. they know that this is important for them to know because then they can go back to their day. And this actually is interesting and making me curious because now you say now the focus is give to the audience what they're looking for and what they matter and rather than just keep the people in the page and reading for minutes. And in some way, this is drastically changing from the past where the result of project like a, a magazine was all about how much time people spend in the yeah. magazine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which was what, for example, at Viacom, that was basically my mission yeah. as a as a as a designer. How can I make sure that people open the, the I don't know the MTV app and stay it stays there, right? They they look for more videos, they watch more videos and so on. Um, now yeah it's uh, it's it's different. Uh, mm -hmm. We are trying to give uh, more reasoning behind you opening our website or our app and we are trying to give you more value of your time yeah i think that's the most the, the part that is intriguing me more about the work is axio is doing because 
is a is a big challenge is there a thinking how you produce information and then you deliver information in the way the people consume to the information often very very fast and very quickly because you just swipe up in the phone and you read a bunch of title maybe in three four seconds you want to know what does it matter in that article if you want to read more but it's not anymore about the time and i believe as a company and as a designer as well for you it's a big challenge they're thinking about okay how i'm going to do my work how i'm going to lead it in a different way this kind of practice that's really really fascinating to me and also this lead me in another question for you because i feel like based on what you say design now is always more close to the newsroom or actually where the people produce the content sound like who produced the content it will who actually wrap the content in a way to be consumable are always working more close together is correct yes yes it is um we still need to be very aware of uh keeping the newsroom uh kind of not contaminated by the market mm -hmm. uh so this is a this is a thin line in between you trying to you trying to uh, dictate uh what the user wants versus uh what is important for them to know um but design can facilitate that i think uh it's it would be worthless so for example mm -hmm. we have an amazing type of content and 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 a, and a great way to put that content in front of people which is the smart brevity type of uh, of writing content but that would be pretty much useless if we had a website that doesn't follow that perspective if we have a website where everything is cluttered and we have tons of ads and we have tons of pop-ups uh we're going against the principles of giving people what matters so we don't want to uh, at the same time i think that we are not dictating or trying to oversell uh, our content mm -hmm. we we need to be very aware of how we translate that into 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 design into the experience and you can see that um many i mean the, the way we try to do that in the in the website in, in the app as well i mean the app we, we try to give you this side of sort of uh, nudges of of content but if you want to go deeper you you are you're very in high intention in going deeper is not something that we are forcing you to do it's basically you managing your time and you focusing your time on what really matters to you that's fascinating well i mean i'm still checking the time we are almost on the end i have a last question actually for you uh about all this podcast of course i'm very interested to know the, the story and a different story how the people actually are where they are today and how they arrive because i feel unique journey always create a kind of unique perspective about how mm, approach some problems how actually work the world is working and i wanted to ask to you what's your secret when you have to innovate what do you do i mean what are you looking for the innovation especially like in your job like you know you have a new challenge you know you know you have to invent or redefine something completely different from something you never did before. What are you looking for for innovation? Um, oh, a couple of things, I think. Well, that's a good question. Hmm. <laughs> a couple of things. Um, first, I, I tend to not read too much about design. Okay. I, yeah, I prefer to spend my time around learning, that are related to other stuff i think this is one thing and the other thing i i tend to not ask for permission i prefer to do it even if i have to find ways to do that without really investing time from the team for example uh but i i i, I prefer to come up with ideas that i can show and not tell and i think that is a big big help for driving innovation in a company because if you keep everything in a spreadsheet or in a deck you yeah. don't go too far because i think we designers we have one thing that it's very sort of natural for us which is visualization 
we can easily visualize things that others struggle to visualize. So if you can easily just put that on a paper, on a prototype, on something that you can show, everything goes to the next level. And it's much more, it's much easier for you to um, at least start talking about innovation. Absolutely. And also the, I call it the visual evidence. No, the fact, as you say, to make something tangible, first uh, remove a lot of uh, wrong assumption and gaps because yep. people see the things they cannot misinterpret the things yeah and second is facilitating a lot of sharing of ideas between everyone and open conversation in a useful way i totally agree with you yep. but also i mean now i'm i'm going to close but i want also mentioning you have a podcast right i do yes uh, yeah and it's I called do. expatria what is it about Expatria, so yeah, so um, it's, uh, I interview Brazilian designers hmm. and that came up because I was so frustrated with Brazil uh, hmm. when I moved to the US that I thought, you know what, I could help people by talking to other designers that migrated and uh, I could basically show them that it's not impossible, that if you want to leave the country I mean, you can you can leave the country forever, or you can just leave for experience, but you can do it. Uh, and uh, and I thought that talking to people that are already outside Brazil, it would be a good idea to just help the community mm. in general. Uh, and then that grew because, uh, of course, I talked to I talked to designers that are living here in the U.S., designers living everywhere, New Zealand, Europe, everywhere. And then I I went back to Brazil in terms of uh, talking to designers in Brazil and I uh, and then the last the last season I covered the story of the digital design in Brazil which we, we, very it was very nice but it's in Portuguese it's in Portuguese so sorry um, but yeah I, I, I do have a so if you want to try your Portuguese it's expatria e x p a t r i a and it's okay. everywhere Actually, all, all I, have, I have a few Brazilian friends. I'm pretty sure they are living right now in Italy. I'm pretty sure we are going to follow your podcast right now. Oh, cool. I'm okay, going to share well, it. Okay. Thank you all for your time and sharing your story and your perspective is so int and intriguing. And I, I would love to actually stay here talking more with you. But maybe we can organize another episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank and you. Very for, cool. for everyone who wants to be in contact with Al, um, you can find all the links and information in the video description. And remember also to subscribe for uh, Alia Stories here on YouTube and Instagram. Al, thank you very much again. Thank you, Mirko. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Obrigado.